Hello, welcome to a Kote and Me. All right, what's this all about? Well, since the age of about 12, I have been mildly obsessed with the European Car of the Year Award. Uh, it all started when the old man brought home a new for the time Mark II Vauxhall Colton. And on the back window was a sticker for the European Car of the Year winner. And from there, I was just hooked. Fast forward about 30 years. Oh, no, I don't like it. Um, and here I am now setting myself a bit of a challenge. Can I own, from the year I was born, <coughs> 1974, uh, every car of the year award winner? It's a bit of a challenge. And I know there's going to be certain cars which are unobtainium or, or just so expensive that it's just not going to be viable not at the moment anyway but i want to try and see what these cars are all about why were they awarded the european car of the year uh, what is it that made them special so that's where you come in lovely viewers as i invite you to share the pain and misery i'm about to put myself through all in the name of car science finding, fixing and driving some 30 odd European Car of the Year winners. <sighs> this is gonna be fun. Anyway, where do we start? Ah, the 90s. New model, the Mondeo in Britain today. It's not radically new, it's not made in Britain, except for the engines. But Ford's hopes are riding on it. Project CDW27 was the name given by Ford for its first global car. Seven years and six billion dollars in development, the Mondeo went on sale in its launch in March 1993 at the Geneva Motor Show. The Mondeo was to replace the aging Sierra in Europe and the Tempo and Mercury Topaz in North America. It's fair to say Ford was in the doldrums with its model range and knew that they had to deliver a completely new class leading design to stand a chance against its competition. Safety was predicted to be a more important element in car design early on in the Mondeo's development, and so it came with an impressive safety package which included a driver's airbag as standard, which was a class first. Ride and handling were also high on the Mondeo's priority list. Its incredible driving dynamics were shaped in part by the engineering brilliance of Richard Parry Jones, who would go on to influence the way Fords would drive for years to come. All right, well, enough with the history lessons. May I present to you the first car of the year ticked off the list, my 1995 Mondeo 2.0-litre SI. First off, my apologies for only having a few pictures to show you, but like the numpty that I am, I forgot to record anything when I bought the car. The pics give you a pretty decent flavour of what I was dealing with, which, in fairness, was a fairly straight car that had sat in a garage for the best part of five years and was in need of some life being breathed back into it. So it was being sold as a spares or repair uh, as it had a running issue which the seller thought was a dodgy fuel pump. Cosmetically it needed attention to, surprise surprise, the rear seals and the paint was pretty flat in quite a few areas. The interior was in excellent shape thankfully uh, and just needed the radio to be refitted. Footnote. It was a big of a job and it wasn't very easy at all. Anyway, let's get on with making this thing roadworthy, shall we? Priority number one, get it running. So first off, um, an obvious disclaimer, uh, I am nowhere China 
and uh, proof of the pudding is the pictures you're seeing at the moment. Um, in all honesty, I didn't think this is a job I couldn't handle, um, but the Haynes Manual and various sort of online guides were basic at best at how to get um, the lines off for the fuel pump. That was a real struggle. And as you can see, I was using all methods of medieval torture to try and get it off. But um, I did indeed find a 10 year old potato cam YouTube video that actually showed taking off the connectors properly. And after all that wriggling, here's the money shot. Oh, there it is. Whoa. Still gushing? Push, Mrs. Sixteen Valve, a push. Ah, congratulations. It's a beautiful baby fuel pump. So the strip of the fuel pump begins, but I can't help thinking I've seen that face before. For mash, get smash. Okay, so I installed a new motor into it, uh, which was quite a difficult process having to draw the cap off, but I did it, a new screen, uh, made sure the wiring was okay, uh, and then back in the car, and hopefully it was all sealed in correctly. Uh, that was always my worry. And then it was fingers crossed time that it would fire up. Going there. Clickety click. Right, here we go then. <gasps> Can't believe it started. Okay. Well, nothing's. Nothing appears to be peeing out or anything like that. Man, that actually sounds really smooth. Well, this one's a little bit of a time jump. Uh, this happened um, quite a way after the stuff you've just seen. Uh, it had actually been for an MOT, but it had failed. Um, one of the fails was the tie rod end, um, obviously was split. So here's me, never having done one of these before, uh, getting the old one out. And as you can see, absolutely knackered. Um, so yeah, it was quite experienced. 
getting it out, levering it out, but um, nice new shiny one, ready to pop back in, which is all good. Uh, and I didn't do the other side purely because the MOT didn't require it. Uh, in hindsight, I probably should have done both sides, but hey ho, it was just really to get it on the road. So it was a bit of a fight popping it back in, but I got there in the end. And as you can see, once I've done all that up, one shiny new tie rod end. Well, it is definitely time to get rid of that absolutely disgusting front registration plate. And there you go, lovely shiny brand new plate on the front and the back as well. I did keep the uh, original dealer plate on, from the back of the car. Uh, and I'm going to try and get one of those replica services um, and get them both printed up. But I think it looks pretty good. Willkommen to the first merchandise tut corner where I get to showcase some of my extensive collection of Car of the Year merch. So whatever's in the cabinet, I'm grabbing it. And what's on display today is this handsome packet of Porsche 928 matches. Imagine stepping out of your all crisis friendly V8 Grand Tourer, adjusting the lapels of your crushed velvet dinner jacket and making your way to the table you reserved at the local Bernie Inn. Prawn cocktail, 12 ounce T-bone and a slice of Black Forest Gatto all washed down with a nicely chilled glass of Liebfrau Milch or four. And the finale to this fabulous banquet is striking one of these Teutonic Tinder sticks so you can enjoy the clean crisp flavour of an Embassy Gold cigarette. Lighting fires has never been so stylish. Dana, what do you think? All right, I know you've just seen this for the last 10 minutes being fixed, but here it is in the metal, taxed, MOT and insured on the road. I couldn't be more chuffed. As a, as a, as a challenge, this is such a good starting car. I'm so happy. And it looks pretty good in silver, yeah? I love it. Very striking. There's plenty of things that still need sorting out of it. Mechanically, this car is fantastic. It drives so good. Uh, Body-wise, it still needs bits and bobs doing to it. There's a bit of crazy and there's a tiny bit of rust coming on the roof. Um, there's a few bits, like the door mirror's got some exposed sort of uh, 
primer on it. I don't know where it's been hit or something in the past, but fundamentally this car looks fantastic. I'm just so pleased with it. But as we know, this isn't just for gulping at, this is for driving. So let's get out there, get some impressions and find out whether this thing really is worthy of 1994's European Car of the Year award. So what's it like driving CDW27, Ford's world car? Well, you can see Ford put a lot of effort into this one. Straight out the box, the Mondeo has set the bar exceedingly high. It had its work cut out with competitors like a Nissan Primera, Toyota Carina E, even the old Peugeot 405 was still setting a benchmark for ride and handling. But in one giant $6 billion stride, Ford eclipsed all of them. First of all, I can't believe this car went on sale in 1993. It feels so modern. From the soft fill plastics of the dashboard to the nice airy cabin helped by this low waistline, this really is a pleasant experience and a lovely place to be in. Yeah, it suffers from the age old 90s curse of a low roof line. The likes of me can't really sit properly in it without cocking my head over or having the, the hunch. But to everyone else, it's excellent. Elbow room, leg room. Ford really went to town with making sure everyone that drives this car was going to be comfortable. The range of adjustment for steering, in and out, up and down, seat height adjustment, even the seat belt height can be adjusted. Just means everyone can be comfortable in it. There's no compromises. Well, unless you're six foot seven. What's great is the interior uh, switch gear, the um, knobs and buttons and levers, they all feel still very crisp in their action. One thing I absolutely love about Fords of this era are the, the stubby indicator stalks and wiper stalks. These things feel so good to use and they look really good as well. I absolutely love these things. The way this Mondeo was put together, uh, with the, the way the, the buttons feel in the hand, the texture of the plastics, there's not a lot of shiny bits in here. Um, the, the way the upholstery feels, like it's pretty lush feeling. It actually all comes together to give a feeling um, of, of quality. It's not something you would have associated with uh, a Ford really of that era, but they put a lot of time and energy and money into making this feel a, way more special than um, a rep car, for want of a better way of putting it, should have been. I think it has to be applauded really, because they could have uh, they could have cut corners a little bit, but I think it's testimony to just how well they did putting it together that a car that's 25 odd years old now still feels good. I think what's really impressed me so far is the ride quality. You forget cars from the 90s, they're running, this one's running 15 inch alloys. It's just so supple. Those high sidewalls do such a great job of just ironing out most of the bad potholes and ruts in the road. They make it such a comfortable cruiser. But you can still shove it around a bend and it actually feels like it's going to take the corner no problem. It gives you a lot of confidence. I forget just how 
good these things used to ride. Everything's so crashy, massive alloy wheels, taut suspension. This thing actually feels like it's connected to the road, but it's not gonna put you in traction. It's excellent. My problem at the moment is that I'm enjoying just how well you can hustle this around the bends. Enjoying it a little bit too much. Problem is, I really am beginning to fall for this Mondeo's charms. Gen built Zeta engine, oh, Zetec nope. engines, were prime examples of sales executive pecking order. You had the 1.6 90 brake horsepower junior rep, a 1.8 115 brake horsepower newly promoted area manager, uh, the 136 brake horsepower 2 litre for the well established regional manager. Of course, if your monthly performance figures weren't up to scratch, there's always the 88 brake horsepower, 1.8 Dagenham built turbo diesel that you could be threatened with in case things didn't improve. Oh, and of course, for the high flying executive, there's the 170 brake horsepower Cleveland built Duratec V6, but you couldn't order that at launch. That was a little while afterwards. I have to say, the 2 litre in this model, definitely a departure from the usual sort of early 90s 16 valve engines of the time. Gone is the peakiness of power and lack of torque low end that we were sort of accustomed to at that time. Now, it actually feels more like an 8 valve with the talkiness of the engine at lower revs, but it can still spin to quite a, quite a healthy six and a half thousand before it starts dying off. They're not the most refined engines, I've got to say. They're, what's the best way of putting it? Quite gruff, I think is probably the best way of putting it. But they've got a bit of poke to them though. So the Mondeo can be hustled down a back road like a sports car, but what's it like in its natural habitat? The place where the majority were destined to spend most of their lifetime. The motorway. Immediately, I'm struck by the fact that uh, I'm doing, doing 70 miles an hour and I've got just over 3,250 revs. It's quite, it's quite buzzy. I mean, law-abiding sales reps might start getting the old ear bleed after a while, having to do... Uh, I'm going to go up and down the country in one of these, but this is the close ratio gearbox because uh, it's the SI model. Spolt, so you know you uh, you put up with the buzziness to have that urgency when you're uh, 
milling around town. But I'm sure the um, the normal ratioed uh, 1.6s and 1.8s were much better on the motorway than this. A lot better for your ears anyway. So one thing I don't think you get a lot of on car reviews and road tests is the passenger's opinion of things. So I've been racking my brains at how I can do that best and by the magic of television I think I've got the answer. Ready? Oh well that worked a treat. Oh tea. Cheers. Ah. Oh. So how's the review going? All good? Enjoying it? Like the car? It is lovely. Drives really well. It really does. You want me to get back on with it, don't you? Okay. Sorry. Okay, right. Let's get on with the review. First things first, I am very tall, 6'7". So I'm not really going to fit in the back of many cars comfortably. Um, but saying that, this isn't that bad. I mean, this seat is set up for a six footer uh, and I can get my feet underneath, you know, at a push I could get my knees together. Any one of a normal height will be fine here. The rear bench is really soft, uh, but nicely padded. You even get central armrest, oh, all the mod cons. There's a uh, ashtray, you remember smoking? This model, the SI, it's got keep fit windows, so you don't get the uh, the fancy stuff until the, the gear model, but it's all right, it doesn't matter. Uh, I suppose the only thing, again, the 90s cars afflicted with is the curse of the low roof line. So my head's sort of uh, scraping the roof, getting a lot of friction burns from that. But other than that, because of the way that the chassis is with uh, uh, coping with the bumps it's very very supple and soft it, it's a really nice place to be but I think I really need to be up front driving so let's get back up the front oh we're not in Kansas anymore Dorothy Okay, uh, I think I'm going to need some practice on that one. I'll tell you what, these things really do soak up the miles well. I mean, even these sport seats, sport seats, are just so comfortable to sit in. They're like armchairs. There's no numb bums at the end of this journey, that's for sure. This car's dynamic, it's composed, it actually feels quite grown up that there's been a lot of thought in the design. I wonder so many people were eager to get behind the wheel. Well, this is probably going to be the easiest decision I'm going to make on a Cote and Me. Is the Ford Mondeo deserving of the European Car of the Year Award for 1994? Yeah, of course it is. Ford were desperate to change their image from safe, conservative and quite frankly boring maker of cars. And the Mondeo was the catalyst for that change revolution started right here with the introduction of the new edge design philosophy cars like the car k ka and the puma uh, and in 1998 the best of them all the ford focus and change really was to do with this car it was all thanks to monday i think so to the Akoti judges, I salute you. To Ford and their Mondeo, chef's kiss. Mwah. And to you, dearest viewer, thank you very much for watching. 
and I hope the, uh, I'll see you in the next episode. Hello? Brenda, what have you got for me today? 10 copiers for Birmingham City Council. They want to upgrade to colour. Okay, Brenda, I'm on my way. <laughs>